Hello and welcome to today's edition of URP Practical Talk. I'm your host, George Gonzalez. And today we have in the studio the current acting general secretary as well as the managing director of Diamond Optical, Mr. Raul Aaron. Thank you for coming in. Thank you so much for inviting me. Right. So, yes, of course, um, you know, definitely we're taking a little bit of a departure than uh, our usual guest that we have, Dr. Bandu, but uh, that I know that you're here and that you're here to tell us a lot of great things about the URP. So, um, I guess but before we go into that, uh, let, I guess, can we, let's talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Bandu himself. Um, that I guess more specifically, well, what's your view on him? Well, you know, let's take a, let's take a look at um, at a leader, you know, because every political, um, every politician that um, has um, an intention to to become president must have certain leadership qualities that is not only enshrined in their personal um, well-being, but also in the things that they do and how they execute their lives in general. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Mr. Bandu is a very um, successful businessman. And I believe that he has the, the knowledge and understanding of how business works. Close to how business works is exactly how politics works. And I believe that he has not only the capability, but the enthusiasm to take Guyana to the next level. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I came on board the United Republican Party. I believe for years, we in Guyana have become burdened down with two political parties, basically, striving to outdo each other. And I believe we need some freshness to the camp. And that is exactly what the URP and Mr. Bandu provides for the person out there who is saying, this upcoming election is going to be a mess. How can I stay away from the mess and make a statement in relation to the future of this country? I believe the answer to that would be to join a political party that is led by someone who has the interests of every citizen in this country at heart. And this has not only been demonstrated by words, but it's been demonstrated in relations to his actions. The United Republican Party has already, since the end of the last election in 2015, they have not missed a beat, but to start again, to demonstrate to the Guyanese populace in general and to the electorate that we are the party that is all inclusive, no racial bias in relations to what has been traditionally, or has, in, has traditionally engulfed the political sector. And this is another point that I really want to drive home and make a statement in relations to Mr. Bandu's view on racism. And this is one of the reasons why I've come aboard. Most persons, look at a political party these days and it has been tradition it is it is it's enshrined in our our tradition that once you're voting it must be for race and this is evident because only the uh, only the other day there have been a new political party that has been formed by you know the indigenous people it shows that guyana is leading down a path of racial biases that is going to destroy this country. Mr. Dr. Bandu and the United Republican Party has reversed that and has opened the doors for every race, creed, and class to come on board. And I believe this is the place to be, the United Republican Party, led by political candidate, presidential candidate, Mr. Vishen Bandu. Singing some high praise for the man. <laughs> well, you know, we campaigned together in 2015, and we had a very grueling um, um, campaign. You know, we visited 
the length and breadth of the country. And I've seen the man in action in relation to going into various areas, helping persons regardless of race, color, creed, class. And the people reach out to him because for, for a long time, they have not met a leader that br brings a breath of fresh air to them, something that is totally unbiased, you know, no biases. And I believe, um, I believe this is the place. This is the place to be. And so I'm going to now move it a little bit away from uh, Dr. Bandu, and now going to the party's position on education. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Bandu would have spoken, um, you know, heavily about uh, econ the economy, especially the need for a. A resurgence in the agriculture sector but um, can you speak a little bit about the URP's vision for the education sector? The URP vision for education is enshrined in our manifesto and I, I, I come back again to the manifesto of all the political parties. The URP vision for Guyana in relations to education is no child must be left behind. How do we do that? We need to do that first and foremost by examining where we are in relation to education right now in Guyana. And we need to take a look at our nursery and primary, secondary and tertiary level education. We must never miss our technical and vocational studies because it's a paramount important that we look at that sector very closely. But let's get back to our nursery and primary education. Let's leave secondary, tertiary, and the vocational um, part out of it. Guyana is ranked very high by the United Nations in relation to education in the nursery and primary level. We're doing pretty well. And this is something that must be acknowledged. Guyana's done well in this sector. We have been able to move and register over 75% of our children in this country in the nursery school program. And we have been able to transfer um, that same percent to the primary level with a 85% graduation into secondary schools. I believe the common entrance has its issues. But I believe it sets the pillars for a very uh, productive education system. Leading up from nursery, from grade, all the grades coming right up to grade six where you write exams, I believe we are doing pretty good. Of course, there is need for changes. And we're going to get to that. I'm going to get to that later in relation to what we need to do with our teachers and how the actual execution of the education system should happen. But I believe we're doing pretty good when it comes to that. Where we're losing our children and where we're losing the battle on education is at the secondary level. And you can go to the internet, as sad as it is, and just do research on fights in schools mm. and the lawlessness and disorder that is happening right now in our schools. School children fighting, no control in relation to what happens in school. And that is where we're losing our children. Why are we losing our children there? Because they do not feel a part of the system. We are failing them when it comes to educating them in a positive way in the secondary schools. When a child writes common entrance and they are accepted to various secondary schools around the country, they are reasonably set but the curriculum and the execution of the curriculum in the secondary schools is not being done for students who are slow there's a fast pace if you're good and you can write 20 subjects cxe that's fine this system is designed for you we have to understand that the system that is currently being run is not designed for every student. Mm -hmm. And as such, there are students sitting in the classroom and they are sailing through their secondary school programs. 
Now, the URP in our manifesto, we have suggested three things, basically. And the first one is for us to take a look at students coming from the sixth grade into the seventh grade, which we know as force form. Many of those students, when they enter the form, they are matched and grouped with students from all over the country. And that is where the disparity starts. You find that they have a rhythm because common entrance sets a rhythm. But some of the students lose their rhythm in first form. And they cannot keep up with some of the students in their own class. The same thing happens when they go over to second form. And you'll find the same set of students lagging. And the areas that they're lagging in is mathematics and English. And mathematics and English are the platforms yeah. for all the other very subjects. Crucial it's subjects. It's very crucial. Yeah. So the URP has suggested that there be a division of every class in the secondary school structure. Every class must be comprised of class A and section A and section B. It's simple. If students are slow as they enter seventh grade from the common entrance, because most of them lack the basic principles of the subject area in English and math, and this is where it needs to be strengthened. They need now, the B section needs to be groomed by a sixth grade teacher and ensure that they understand the principles to be executed in seventh grade. Now, why must a student who is bright and smart wait on that student who is a little slow to be brought up to level while the teacher pays attention to the slow ones the smart ones are being kept back. I'm saying, and the URP is designing an education system to say, hey, the, the A class must begin to rub shoulders because they're smarter with the B section in grade A so that they can be challenged. Mm -hmm. And this must happen at specific times in the day where with specific subjects. If the child that is in grade seven is slow and is in the B section, there should be specific tutors to ensure that they grasp the basic principles to execute that, those subjects. So we divide that class into two. So we have A and B in grade seven, we have A and B in grade eight, grade nine, and so and on. So on. So so what is happening basically is that those students who are slow in grade A, they have to learn some more principles. So they get to rub shoulders with the B, or the A, sorry, they get to rub shoulders with the A section in grade seven. So essentially every preceding grade is basically feeding into that next one kind feeding of pushing into the, next the one. slow ones in the grade above them exactly on okay so the fast ones in the grade below are pushing the slow ones in the grade above okay. in the grade above hmm. so it's a it's a domino effect hmm. and that will lead to a leveling of the education standard because that's where we're losing our students we're losing our children in the secondary schools. And if we don't introduce a method to combat that, then students become very disinterested in what is happening in the classroom. And if that happens, and it's happening, they find alternatives. What they do most of the day is to distract the students who wants to move on. Okay, now we're looking here at the end of a very vicious cycle, mm. a very vicious social cycle. Because most students who are disruptive in school, they don't get disruptive in the classroom. Mm. This happens at home. Mm. In this country right now, we have more single parent homes with mothers leading those homes 
then we have fathers. Mm. Fathers because of jobs. And this, not this did not happen only in this, um, this government. It happened in the, the, the government prior to, who had completely dismantled jobs. And everyone is talking about jobs and, and, and how many jobs they've created. And there just isn't enough job creation to encapsulate the entire population. And that is why we need to work harder. And I'm sure Mr. Band, uh, Dr. Bandu would have spoken about this in relation to the economy and us you know, creating small and medium-term business, medium-sized businesses so that we can create employment. Persons need to become entrepreneurs rather than going out and looking and seeking employment. But let's get back to the education system. And we have to start doing things like what China does. They start streamlining their students Mm -hmm. Their children from a very early age in relation to exactly what they want to do. And I tell you this, not every child can become a doctor or a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And parents seems to be fixed on the position that my child must become a doctor. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is lacking in school is career guidance. Mm -hmm. Career guidance is one of the challenges that we're facing in this country in relation to your education system. That is really crushing us. So most students are essentially just meant to fend for themselves in terms of oh, figuring oh, oh, what career path they I, actually I, want I, to I, I am saying this, and, 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 and I want you to test it. Mm. Walk up to any child who has just written CXC exams and ask them what they want to do. Mm. They just don't know. Wow. You know why? Because they have not been educated in relation to what they can do. I met a child from Richard Ishmael just the other day, and I asked him what he wanted to become. And he said he wanted to become a doctor. And I said, a doctor in what? And he said, well, you know, I want to, um, I want to operate on persons. I want, to, uh, I want to be a brain surgeon, you know? Um, so I said, okay, so you're the top of your class. You must be a real high flyer. And when we checked him, his, his, his grade average was, uh, was just around 48%. Mm -hmm. You know, someone needs to speak to that student in a very positive way and to guide him in relation to what his, his academic status is and to interrogate him in relation to what he wants to do and what his aptitude can allow him to do. So I suggested, I said, um, maybe um, a good field for you to get into would be to, to take a look at um, becoming an X-ray technician. Have you ever thought about that? And he asked me, what is that? Mm -hmm. I said, um, have you ever heard about radiology and how we do a CT scan? And what is a CT scan? He said, no. You know what he told me that was surprising? His mom told him that he should become a nurse. And when he's finished the nursing program, then he can become a doctor. Mm. That baffled me. Because that child would spend five years or four years becoming a nurse, which is an independent profession. Yeah. And then stop and then switch to becoming a medical doctor which is a whole new profession, when he could have utilized that four years to start his pre-study, his pre-med, mm -hmm. to get into med school. So what I'm saying, and I don't blame the parent, the parent just don't know. What are the basic steps that that child should take to become a doctor? In every field, there are so many subfields that persons can be involved in if they want to be involved in the medical field. Anesthesiologists, it's a good field. And there are so many branches of medicine that persons need to get involved in. But you know what? They don't know because there is not proper career guidance in school to guide them. I'll give you another example. I run an optical operation and I'm trying to find a laboratory technician. And we put out an application 
uh, uh, a wanted notice in the um, newspapers and persons came in and we started interviewing them. And there were no, there was no one there that had the aptitude and skill that we needed. Mm. So I asked them to show me the, the, the short list. And when I took a look at it, we saw two persons there that had fabrication skills. Metal, plastic, and wood fabrication. To put a lens into glasses mm. is fabrication. Mm -hmm. We employ them. And now they're the best at their jobs. The human resource managers in this country has to understand how to assess persons' human resource skills so that they can properly place them. So we have some challenges in our education system that has dominoed right in to how we are employed. There are many persons out there who are employable, but the human resource managers and the human resource needs are stereotyped with what they want for a particular job, and they would not shift. We have to study our education system and see where our children are coming from. And we're persons um, who are persons who have graduated. What, what is their aptitude and what they can do? And that brings us to the fact that not every child is going to want to become a doctor or a lawyer. They're going to want to do something technical. And we need engineers in this country. You know, with the, with the advent of oil, we need, um, we need engineers in every field to ensure that that industry keeps propelling. So we need to pay some serious attention to our technical and vocational studies, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what our technical and vocational institutions has to offer. And I can tell you that taking a look at our technical and vocational um, institutions, Companies like Banks, DIH, and DDL, they need to start to sponsor various programs in relation to GITC, G, you know, um, GTI, and the, you know, the University of Diana. So that persons who are leaving these institutions are ready to work at those specific companies. If they do not start to plow back into do these institutions, they will find that they do not have the requisite human resource skills that are employable within their organization and institutions. And they need to be a, an assessment, an evaluation of what is being taught in those, in those institutions as against what is needed in the workplace. How can you have in your technical and vocational institutions, persons using saw and the old model electric saws. And whereas when they are when they're on the job, they are required now to use the most efficient one that they have, one that is 10 years advanced to the ones they're using in the classrooms. That person still have to go and do on the job training again. They cannot hit the road running. So not only the education system need to be looked at in a very positive way. But I believe organization and institutions that are going to be employing the human resource skills need also to take count and to take stock of exactly what they're doing. Mm. It's, it's essentially they're feeding by building up the students, by building up the, uh, the educational uh, abilities of these students, their aptitudes by really helping them to grow it also then helps the businesses in turn because when they then go to look to employ these people, they literally, they, they have the people to employ. They have the people yeah, to employ. Looking for the, the skills and they actually funded to have these people to have these skills. So. It is difficult and it's difficult. I understand their position because it's difficult to, to, um, to train, retrain persons who are already trained, you know, and they need to strike a parallel in relations to what are being what what is what is taught at the institutions and what the work environment needs. Another very important point within the education system, and the United Republican Party has emphasized this, is the parents, parent teachers association. 
in relations to how the parent teacher associations within schools can actually help the education system to move forward. I believe that a large percent of the, the work or the principles are taught in school. But when that child gets home, that's where parents need to become very involved in relations to education. And I believe that the, the Parent Teacher Association, right now, most of them throughout the length and breadth of the country, they are held there for fundraising activities. And, and it's, it's important, but it is not the only thing that Parent Teachers Society is supposed to do. This is bringing the parents and teachers together so that they can exchange thoughts and exchange ideas and exchange what is happening in the classroom. The child do not carry that home in a comprehensive way to the parent. And the parent need to know what is happening in school. And I urge parents, you know, these days to attend parent teachers meetings, you know, to attend those parent teachers meetings so that they can understand what is happening in school. And the school needs to back off from the constant fundraising. Every time a child comes home is what they have to take to school the next day or what fundraising or what bring and buy sale. They never come home and said, look, my, uh, my teacher said that tonight you should look at this education program. The Ministry of Education has a pretty good, um, a pretty good program on, on, on the internet in relation to um, what is taught at every grade. What good is it there if the parents cannot access it? And this is why the United Republican Party has as its major pillar within the information technology sector to utilize technology to take into the interior locations so that we can have electronic classes. And if we have effective and efficient internet in those areas, a, stu a teacher can stand in a classroom at Queen's College or Bishops and execute a lesson mm. and students in um, Tiger Pond, that's after you pass letter, can enjoy the, uh, the same knowledge sharing as a student in the classroom. So a concept like that, especially in such a country where you have such isolated towns and villages, like you've said, it can effectively revolutionize the education of this nation's citizens. Oh, definitely. And I, and I, believe, um, I believe these are things that we are talking about these things. We know about them. And, and the, the, the ministry is, you know, they're not looking at at getting these programs on the road, even in a very small way, before we move to a very large sector. Well, it all sounds like some very interesting points that you're making, but unfortunately, I have to stop you there because it seems like we've run out of time for this evening. But nonetheless, thank you. Thank you for your, for your thoughts on education. And also, we want to thank the viewers at home for watching today's edition of URP Practical Talk. As always, I'm your host, George Gonzalez, and we ask you to find URP on the website, www.urpguyana.com, and you can also visit us on Facebook, URP Guyana. And so again, Mr. Aaron, thank you for coming in. Thank you for speaking with us and sharing your views on education. It was and a pleasure being here, man. Thanks. Thank you.